Well, good evening. Welcome to our Ghosts Upon the Earth seminar. Uh, it's really beautiful that you all had time to uh, come and spend the evening with us. We're really excited about the conversation we're going to have tonight. The subject, obviously, is deeply, deeply important to, to us for all for various different reasons and might be something that we're struggling with, might be something that friends or family are struggling with. And it, for us as pastors, it's a privilege to be able to create space like this to talk about this. Uh, I hope that you are looking forward to the evening. Why don't you just take a moment and say hi to the people at your table, get yourself settled. Uh, maybe just tell them your name and, you know. <laughs> Some of you might be long familiar West Side uh, attenders. I know some of you are not from West Side. It really is a privilege to have you sharing the evening with us. Hope you feel really welcome. Hope you've all got a coffee, uh, a little snack to keep you going. Uh, and uh, we're looking forward to a great evening together. What I'd like to do, if that's okay with all of you, is just open our evening with a word of prayer. And, uh, and then I'll let you know how things are going to go. Uh, Father God, we... We always invite you into spaces that we know you're already here, but we invite you as a way of opening up our hearts. Uh, we say, God, some things are beyond us, some things are bigger than us. And for many of us, whatever reason has brought us to be in this room tonight, we, we know that you are always helping us with that and guiding us with that. But still, we commit ourselves this evening to learn, to try and understand, to try and be, to be helped uh, to be open in, with ourselves in our own journey uh, of struggling with things that life has thrown our way that we perhaps didn't expect, things that feel like they're beyond us. So God, we invite you to be with us, to guide us, to help us, and just to be present in everything that we do this evening. Amen. Amen. So it's my pleasure to introduce you to Jerry Fitch this evening, who is going to be uh, teaching and facilitating our evening. Our plan for the evening is to essentially hand over to Jerry. She will uh, run through a variety of things that I think you'll find hugely helpful, and there will then be some time for questions at the end. We're aiming to sort of finish sharp at 8.30, as we said that we would, but uh, it might be that some of you want to hang around afterwards, and we'll create some more space for questions, uh, but for those of you that know that you've got to get home at 8.30 for the babysitter or whatever, then, then that's when we're going to be landing things formally. Uh, just to introduce you to Jerry a little bit more, Jerry's been a member of Westside uh, King's Church since 2008. She's married to Drew, who is loyally here uh, with us this evening, uh, and they have two adult daughters. She's a registered psychologist in the province of Alberta, so if you've been with us for the uh, three parts that we did on Sunday of Ghosts Upon the Earth, now the professional is going to speak to you, uh, and, uh, so hopefully that'll be more helpful. You're more than welcome to tell them where I was wrong and uh, all the sort of things that, that I said. Um, she's been in uh, private practice in both individual marriage and family therapy in Calgary since 2001. She has a master's uh, in adult education and also in counseling psychology. Was until uh, last year an adjunct professor at Ambrose University Seminar. Hopefully you're getting the picture that she is well qualified to lead us through this evening. I'm also particularly interested that she was also a member of the 1980 84 Olympic track team, um, so which I thought was pretty cool. So I felt that I should share that with you. <laughs> I also just uh, just as a brief uh, comment, another. Uh, a uh, friend of ours at, at Westside, Robin Sorensen, wrote a book a little while back called Anxiety, A Healing Journey. Uh, Robin's done a lot of work in this particular uh, area, and so we have some of her books. They're available uh, at the back for $15 tonight. You can buy them on Amazon as well, but they're $23 on Amazon. It's very rare that you can underprice Amazon, uh, and this comes from knowing the author. So it might be that some of you would like a book, the, something to maybe read and think about a little bit afterwards, so Lana will be able to help you uh, just at the back with them. You can pay with debit, credit card, uh, or even cash, although apparently we only have the exact cash, so you can either pay the exact amount of $15 $15 or make a generous donation to the person behind you in the, in the line. <laughs> so I hope that's okay. But anyway, without further ado, let me hand over to Jerry and uh, she will take us through our evening together. Thank you, Jerry. Thanks. Hi. Um, David, in his brilliant teaching series on Ghosts Upon the Earth, has done an inspiring and a thorough job of laying a spiritual and scriptural foundation for understanding mental illness in the context of Christian community. 
It's great that so many of you want to continue dialoguing uh, as a community about this. Um, one of the most difficult things with mental illness is the secrets that go along with it, the shame, the fear, the stigmas. And it's very encouraging to see people wanting to uh, address this, to understand it, to know how to manage it in people in their community and people that they're really close to. So thank you for committing to be here uh, tonight. It's encouraging to see. Our goal tonight is to build on the teaching that David gave us from a clinical perspective, to help those of you that are here to learn as well as maybe reaffirm some of the specific principles and truths with some practical strategies to live with or alongside fear, anxiety, and depression symptoms. My heart's desire and my passion in the work that I do in counseling is really designed to offer hope for and to see healing for people who suffer and for those who stand and walk with those who struggle with mental illness. No matter how short or how long-term that journey is, no matter what the cause or the symptoms, and no matter how complex those symptoms are. So I'm going to begin my teaching tonight by confessing that despite my training and experience in this a great introduction. I'm not a miracle worker with a foolproof, logical, or biblical formula for healing and supporting mental illness. Sometimes, many of you may firmly or desperately believe that if you can just help someone who is struggling to get medication or professional counseling, he or she will be fixed. And while that's a noble plan, it's a lot of pressure on psychologists and psychiatrists and on those getting the help that this is all that's needed for them to be well. Despite recent genetic research and clinical advances, much of what we know about the brain and neuroscience and behavior is still a mystery to all of those who study it. Mental illness and its interconnection to physical illness reminds us that healing has many facets, and thus, many resources can impact our journey of health over the course of our lives. And so I believe we all have a key relationship role to play understanding and walking with mental illness. There's no perfect formula and no guaranteed outcomes. So thus, all of our roles often require us to be teachable and to persevere over time. But it's actually humility that's the beginning of wisdom and gives us the ability to learn about mental illness. Mental illness is a part of the human condition. And to some extent, we all struggle with emotional and cognitive symptoms of fear, anxiety, self-doubt, insecurity, sadness, and hopelessness. Sometimes it's explainable, and sometimes it's not. At times, it presents as simple but often it's very complex. It's confusing, it's recurring, and it's unpredictable. Sometimes it has a sudden onset, and sometimes it's a storm cloud we can see on the horizon moving towards us. My own recent challenge with anxiety and full-blown panic during airplane turbulence has been difficult to negotiate personally and for those who travel with me. Its onset two years ago was related to a specific intense episode of turbulence. And despite what I know and do, my intense fear symptoms have been very difficult for me to manage and understand, especially in light of the fact that my husband, who also experienced the initial turbulence incident, didn't develop or experience the visceral triggered panic responses over time that I have. This seminar, I'm going to bookend first with an appeal and then an exhortation from scriptures written in the book of Philippians. In chapter 1, verses 9 to 11, the apostle Paul writes, This is my prayer, that your love may abound more and more in knowledge and depth of insight, so that you may be able to discern what is best and may be pure and blameless for the day of Christ. That's something for all of us to remember as we try to understand and walk through mental illness, either our own or with others. 
But I want to first confirm that my theology and my personal Christian journey in faith matches pretty closely and affirms what David and Scripture has taught us in his three-part series. Despite what I cannot control or understand in the minds and lives of clients I have and their families and friends and colleagues, I do know with certainty that God sees us, that God loves us, and that God stays consistently in relation to us unconditionally, both when we're well and emotionally and cognitively present to ourselves and to others and to him, and we have, when we have little or no capacity and are floundering in the depths of fear of the dark nights of the mind and soul. I believe that ghosts among us are not really ghosts at all. They are real people who need to be seen, moved towards, included, and counted on, despite their challenges and suffering. When we know and value them for who they are rather than label their illness or hide from their symptoms in awkward dances, they will become more visible and real both to themselves and to those of us in community with them. God desires to work in our healing, but even if we or those we care about do not become well, he is still there. He sees us and he gives us the strength to endure all present and future challenges. So I believe God is present in every part of our lives and can and does intervene through a community of supported, knowledgeable people and their prayers, as well as clinical and spiritual resources. And often, it happens through many coordinated interventions at once and over time. So God sees us, God heals, God answers our prayers, and God is always good all the time. So, I work as a counselor in humility, in the presence of grace, and I try very hard to listen carefully with patience to my clients and their community of relationships to understand what they know and need and to assess their capacity to move towards small steps to create and sustain wellness. I am always surprised at their resilience of people but never surprised by the hope that is within them when they are loved and supported by their intimate and supportive relationships. So I want to begin with a potential paradigm shift. I'm going to give you two clinical scenarios to relate to where you're given a personal clinical news of a diagnosis. And as you experience them with me, I'd like you to note or jot down your thoughts and feelings. You have on your table some handouts. There's a one-page handout that has a series of lists of thoughts and feelings and behaviors. Many of you won't need them, but many of you who don't feel much or don't think a lot may want to refer to them to give you some more ideas of the kinds of things I want you to relate to as I'm telling you these things. So, close your eyes, unless you're anxious, and then just find something else to do with your eyes. And listen to these scenarios, and as I go through them, I want you to think about what you're feeling and what you're thinking, and what you might be wanting to do. Okay, you're now in a doctor's office, having gone through some recent testing and assessment, and this is what is told to you in your consult. consult. Hi, your assessment, assessment shows that you have a physical illness called type 1 diabetes. Type 1 diabetes is a lifelong chronic condition in which the pancreas organ produces little or no insulin, a hormone that's needed to allow sugar or glucose to enter cells and produce energy. Classic symptoms of your illness include frequent urination, increased thirst, increased hunger, weight loss, and may include blurry vision, feeling tired, 
and poor healing. The long-term complications of your illness may include heart disease, stroke, kidney failure, foot ulcers, and damage to the eyes. Despite active research, type 1 diabetes has no cure, and the cause is actually unknown. About 80,000 children and adolescents develop this disease every year, and one to three million people have this disease in the United States. The disease can be managed with insulin injections, a diabetic diet, and exercise. But it's important to know and understand your diabetic symptom warning signs and develop awareness and self-monitoring strategies. Now I'm going to refer you to a diabetic specialist who can help tailor your specific medication and lifestyle needs and help you monitor blood glucose levels and manage this illness. So, what are your thoughts and feelings and behaviors as you hear and digest this recent diagnosis I've given you? If you want, take a look at the chart and tick off thoughts, feelings, behaviors. They may be some, they may be all, they may be one or two. What did you just experience in your thoughts and in your feelings as I gave you this diagnosis? Who would you tell about this diagnosis and who would you not tell and why not? Anybody need more time? Okay, we're going to move on. Close your eyes again. And we're going to go back to the doctor's office. Well, your assessment shows you suffer from a mental illness known as bipolar 1 disorder. Bipolar 1 is a life lifelong chronic condition which affects the brain in a way that can cause severe mood swings that vary in length of time. People with bipolar 1 disorder can go from episodes of mania, that's the highs, feeling euphoric and revved up or even irritable, to depression, the lows, feeling down, feeling hopeless. Both high and low mood episodes are outside of what would otherwise be considered a normal range. The levels of two chemical messengers in the brain, called neurotransmitters, which are serotonin and dopamine, may play a role in this mental illness. Despite active research, there is no known cure. The cause is unknown. About 60 million people worldwide have this disorder. Symptoms and mood regulations can be controlled with medication, psychological counseling, and lifestyle approaches to reduce stressors and develop consistent social support. It's important for you to know and understand that bipolar 1 symptom warning signs and to know what they are and develop awareness and self-monitoring strategies to regulate your moods. Now I'm going to refer you to a psychologist who specializes in this disorder and can monitor your medication, mood challenges, and lifestyle needs and help you manage this illness. Now go back to your chart. Look at the same list of behaviors and thoughts and possible feelings that you had when you got diagnosed with bipolar 1 disorder.
Okay, feedback time. What was the difference between how you felt and thought from number one, the physical illness, to number two, the mental illness? Anybody? Throw it out. Very different. How? Okay, different in the sense that you felt some embarrassment, shame, wanted to maybe keep it a secret, didn't know who you were gonna tell. Anybody else? Anybody agree with that? Yep. Okay. The point to this exercise is that almost every fact that I gave you was similar in terms of no cause, lots of people have it, no cure, have to manage it, have to use resources, have to use medication potentially, all the same. One is simply an organ called the pancreas and the other is an organ called the brain. But somehow we make a distinction that there's a weakness or a fault or a something that means we deserved or, or should be blamed for having something that has to do with the brain. And I don't know why that is. It seems to be, it's been there since I started studying. I figured with all of the education we have that that would begin to change. But, but somehow it hasn't. So all I wanted you to do with that was hang on to some of those thoughts and emotions and let them inform you as we start to move through some of the basic facts about mental illness and then on to ways to live alongside uh, those who struggle. Any questions about what we did there? Any thoughts? Okay. There are many complex mental illness diagnoses and related symptoms. And things like the one I just talked about are actually beyond the scope of what we're trying to address here tonight. There are things like schizophrenia, borderline personality disorder, dissociative identity disorder, bipolar one and two. They're among the list. The actual uh, diagnostic manual for mental um, disorders is bigger than the Bible and there's a lot of complexities to it. But what's interesting about a number of these illnesses is they experience symptoms of anxiety and depression within them. So what we're talking about tonight may actually have some um, principles for you that will help you to understand that people with complex mental illnesses experience grief, fear, and anxiety symptoms. So hopefully you might be able to see some, um, some transfer. Um, Okay, so let me go through some facts about anxiety, depression, and fear. Um, I did give you a handout. I prefer you don't um, refer to it because it's there for you, and I'm not going to go through it word for word, but it is there, and if we don't get through everything I wanted to share with you tonight, you know you've got it. Some people like to write notes alongside, so feel free. So, things like genetic predisposition, that means your genes predisposed you to it, Temperament, your intelligence level, whether you have learning disabilities, they're more the hardwired, inherited, basic things that form our nature. But things like our upbringing, the parenting dynamic, our social interactions, our support networks, our education, and very difficult connections to external influences such as trauma or grief or loss, your spiritual and cultural beliefs, if you experience bullying or abuse, or whether you're in healthy or unstable relationships, that forms part of our nurtured self. So both nature and nurture impact who we are and who we're becoming. They inform how we experience the world and how we perceive and cope with ongoing challenges or changes in our environment, or relationships, and they are inevitably part of our lives. 
So you have the classic nature versus nurture argument. And sometimes people think it's one or the other, but my view is both impact how you get better and how you get illnesses and how severe they can be. So let me just talk to you briefly about depression symptoms. I'm only going to give you a, a 3,000 foot up um, summary. People who struggle with depression struggle with thoughts of things like being punished, deserving of blame for their faults. They feel judged, but they also judge themselves. They feel like they failed more than the average person. They can have difficulty with short-term and long-term memory. They can have difficulty focusing, difficulty making decisions, and they're often less able to initiate tasks, and they can entertain suicidal thoughts. They often feel hopeless, and that's what the sui su suicidal thoughts are about, because they really believe that things won't get better. Those are their thoughts. Their feelings are hopeless, worthless, helpless, and they can be unable at times to experience joy. They struggle with low energy, with lethargy, they can cry constantly, or they cannot be able to cry, and they can just generally feel very sad. Physically, people with depression have trouble falling asleep or staying asleep. They experience weight loss or weight gain. They have a decreased experience of pleasure. They worry about looking unattractive, and they believe they're a burden to others. So these thoughts that I've said, these feelings that they have, and the physical difficulties can cause them to isolate from other people. The symptoms that I've just explained can be more or less present from hour to hour with people who are depressed or day to day. And depression is usually clinically diagnosed when six or more of those symptoms I talked about occur at a significant level for three months or longer. So the operative kind of thing here is that they're experiencing it over time. And when they experience it over time, it affects their life and relationships, their work, um, a number of things. Okay, so that's depression. On this side, we have fear and anxiety symptoms. So people who struggle with fear and anxiety think and experience life often by over-focusing on and fearing past regrets or excessive worry about future fears. So let me... The goal in staying well is to stay present to the here and now. People who have anxiety don't stay present for very long. They have trouble focusing because their minds at times are spinning pretty fast. What happens is they start thinking and living in the past and they start worrying about regrets. Sometimes they even distort what happened in the past and make it much more severe or, or difficult or bad or worse than it actually is. But they start going over and ruminating about the time that this happened to me or it happened to my friend or I read about it. And they start living and, and spinning in this way. The other thing that people with anxiety do is that they live in the future. And in doing that, they worry and try to plan for anything that could possibly go wrong and solve it before they get there. Now, what we know about reality is that 90% of the things we worry about never happen. Other things happen, but a person who's anxious is constantly going over in their mind how to prepare for, solve problems that haven't happened yet so that they can stay in control. Anxiety for a lot of people is about control. Questions about that? So when you wonder what's going on in the minds of people who are anxious, a lot of it is spinning thoughts that move here and there. And so what happens is they miss the present because they're too busy worrying about the past and the future. Sometimes their thoughts and speech 
can be faster than others, and they can have racing thoughts and difficulties staying in the present moment, not only with themselves, but with other people. They say, I, I love the analogy of a lot of people who have anxiety look like they're actually quite competent. And I think David sort of alluded to this in his talks. It's almost like this serene duck on a pond who's just casually swimming off in the sunset when underneath the feet are going like this. And the reality is their thoughts are going and they're trying to be very competent and make sure that they've dotted all their I's and crossed their T's and been a perfectionist so that they can avoid extreme things that could happen to them. Um, they can tend to be very hypervigilant in trying to think about scenarios that they need to pre prepare for. The predominant coping behavior in anxiety is actually to avoid situations which might cause anxiety or unwanted consequences or overplan for potential problems that don't occur. So the key word I'm explaining is they try to avoid. They do whatever they can to avoid what might happen. And sometimes when you start to realize fear and panic, people's worlds get smaller when they begin to avoid. Even if it's something as simple as, I don't want to go out to a social event because I'm afraid of being rejected. And so they don't want to go, they come up with excuses, and then their world gets smaller, and before you know it, it's not just that social situation, it's not wanting to go to um, uh, the cafeteria or something where they might have to um, connect with other people. Most anxious thoughts are actually just fear-based, and they'll often, as I said, focus on extreme negative outcomes. The physical symptoms of fear and panic involve hyperventilating, excessive sweating, shortness of breath, hyperventilating, shakiness, and heart palpitations. Sometimes they're very something that you can see, and sometimes they hide them very well. Anxiety thoughts tend to focus on a general fear of significant illness for some people. And they fear that they could get a heart attack or cancer or contacting a contagious disease. It's irrational, but in their minds, they have to plan for it and do all sorts of things to avoid situations in which that might be a problem. And for those of you who understand this or have experienced it yourself, they can then become hypervigilant by going on social media, or not social media, but Google, etc., and start looking at all the side effects of medications or all of the things out there that this could be. They start self-diagnosing themselves. And you don't always know what's going on, but in their mind, they're trying to anticipate and self-diagnose in case so that they can stop it from happening, which, of course, gets them into a cycle. And so sometimes you'll find that they'll make many uh, trips to health professionals to confirm uh, a perceived diagnosis. Um, and sometimes they'll want to diagnose people that they're close to because they're afraid for them. So a big piece of understanding what actually goes on in our minds is that we think when we feel something that that's all there is. And the reality is, feelings don't occur in a vacuum. Feelings are always preceded by thoughts. So if you get nothing else out of, well, why do I feel this way? It's because you thought something first. So thoughts always come before feelings. So if you're feeling sad or angry, it's because you told yourself or let someone else tell you something and you thought it first. Does that make sense? So if you're trying to understand feelings, they're based on thoughts. Behaviors sometimes come out of feelings, sometimes they come out of thoughts. But the beautiful thing about behaviors is they can impact both of these. So when your thoughts are racing, you can choose distracting behaviors that can stop the process for you. But it's always thoughts first, feelings second. So, I want to talk a little bit about therapy so that you understand what therapy can do and what it can't do. Um, 
I really believe that therapy is a very helpful resource. And that's because it's objective. It provides teaching and skill development where needed. It's empathic, and it can be tailored to understanding that individual's history, their present circumstances, their behavior patterns, their stresses, and their life situations. So one-on-one -on -one therapy sometimes touches on a number of things that you may be close to that person and have said to them a hundred times, but they're able to hear it differently because they're not tied to the emotional connections and stresses in the relationship, either to try to please you or to try to um, do whatever to try to keep the relationship going. When you go to somebody who's objective, who's willing to listen, who isn't taking sides, who isn't blaming you, there's a different process that goes on in your ability to hear things. At least that's the, that's the design of it. Clinical interventions and current research consistently suggest that cognitive behavioral strategies are traditionally more effective in treating anxiety and depression symptoms. And that's because they help people identify what their thoughts are and what their feelings are and become aware of how to do skills and, and, um, and uh, be aware of what they're telling themselves when they feel something. And to interrupt that with more uh, healthy feelings and, th sorry, thoughts. So, um, so, one of the things that happens is in therapy is that random thoughts, or in some ways not that uh, grounded thoughts, actually are often based on core beliefs. So if I, and, and, and to identify those core beliefs helps with patterning. So for a person who is not doing well, um, they will in, at times move from those thoughts that are up here to core beliefs, which are, I never get anything right. Listen to the all and never, neverness in my core beliefs. I never get anything right. Um, life never works out for me. I'm not very smart. I don't really um, understand things. Um, I'm lazy. Any of those things that either our minds got twisted or we were told at some point or twisted what we were told. And so we base a lot of our thoughts on these core beliefs that are usually pretty negative and often distorted. If you grow up, and I'm not blaming my parents or other people's parents, but if you grew up with a dad who constantly made sarcastic comments like, you'll never amount to anything, or um, you can't get anything right, or you'll never get married, or whatever they say, it's funny, but it goes into your subconscious and can sometimes then affect your core beliefs about yourself. Even when you know they're not true, they've been imprinted. And, and that's sometimes how dysfunctional upbringing, even with good intentions, can affect us. Um, so, the idea for therapy is to recognize thought distortions, faulty core beliefs, and help people replace them with truthful ones for themselves. And what makes it really helpful is that then you take it from what their general feelings are to role-playing what just happened last week and giving them suggestions and solutions and ideas to do it differently and to try to be more consistent. So, it's skill training. Often planning for deliberately structured and prior identified behavior choices helps people. Um, it helps them distract or disrupt a pervasive distorted thought that, and helps them to reset it. But there are also behaviors that are, that are also worked on as part of therapy and that's attaching yourselves to aerobic exercise, relaxation or visualizing exercises, activities, music, art, social connectedness, prayer, playfulness. So it looks at behaviors, it looks at thoughts, and it hopefully affects feelings. People who struggle with anxiety and depression can train themselves to personally recognize and drown out negative self-talk. We all do it. It's just that for them, it's a little bit more entrenched. And then we want to train them to not argue or negotiate it with, the, with distorted thoughts. Let me, let me go over that again. If a thought is distorted, probably one of the most unhelpful thing you can do is argue with it. That's not distorted. Yes, it is. Now you're cycling into um, trying to negotiate instead of just saying, that's not true. Here's the truth and move on from there. 
Okay, let me make a comment about medications. Medications are effective and they do work. And often they're most needed to level the playing field of baseline mood even before any therapy or other interventions begin. But therapy, medication is not an exact science. And I know it gets bandied about of, well, my kid or my friend or my so-and-so did this and this happened to them and, and now we kind of get these distortions in how medications can and do work. They do require individual assessment, compliance, and professional monitoring over time. One of the ways that we can support people who have chosen to take medication is not to work against that by saying, well, are you sure you need that? Or, well, you're only going to take it for a couple weeks, right? You're not going to have to take that forever, are you? So our fears about and our stigmas about medication can impact how it happens for other people. And the thing is, is that medications work best when coupled with consistent counseling or other interventions that are aimed at more of the cognitive, behavioral, mindful learning and skill strategies. Here's the thing to know about people who are anxious. They often are the ones who resist medication. Why do you think that is? Control, yes. When you're anxious, you want to have control. And if you take medication, there's a potential that you'll lose control. I don't, I don't really understand why, but the thing is, why would I give my mind over to some kind of drugs? And so there's a fear of medication. And it makes sense because it's about control. They feel out of control, so they try to hang on to any control strategies that are familiar to them, even if they're irrational. Walking along anxiety and depression strategies. Some of these are in the handout for those of you who want to check it out. In my office on the wall above my desk, I framed and calligraphied a scripture from Philippians 4, 1 to 3. Here's what it says. Whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. It's about thinking, not feeling. Nothing in that list is about solve problems, fix things. It's about whatever's true and admirable and lovely and praiseworthy. So I've given you an acronym. There's a number of things that obviously are um, strategies, but I tried to throw out an acronym there because it covers a few things. The first, I mean, the word is pure, and that comes from Philippians 4, whatever's pure. P in the acronym is for prayer. We often think we should pray for the person who's struggling. Yes, but the first thing you need to do is pray for yourself. Pray unceasingly for them, but pray for yourself to have compassion and empathy and patience and wisdom and grace. Pray for an ability to hold on to hope for folks who struggle and believe that God and healing is at work even when it's not evident in them. And the best way to do that is with consistent prayer because it's a conversation with God about what this is like for you. So prayer is huge. Just don't stop praying it, just because you can't see evidence of healing in the moment. Second one is understand. It's really important to continually seek to understand, not to say, hey, well, I went to a seminar, I get it now. You continually need to understand what's going on in the mind and lives and feelings of those who are struggling. Understand the diagnosis, yes, but you need to understand. And if you walk closely with somebody, an adolescent, a, a family member, sometimes it might be helpful for you to go to counseling for a session or two to understand what's going on with this person that's really struggling with you. 
because sometimes it's important for you to get a picture of what you're up against and how you can be helpful to it and how you can protect yourself within it. But sometimes it's really helpful to go with somebody that you're wanting to go to counseling because it's very scary for them or there's a stigma attached. And all you really need to do then is to bear witness to and support their work. So I always welcome people into my practice to say, if you want to bring somebody that's close to you that you think would benefit from just hearing this or being alongside you, that would be great. But if you do that, don't talk unless you're asked. It can help you better understand the symptoms um, for the people. But remember, whether you go to counseling or whether you read a book or whether you go to a seminar, seminar Resist the temptation to, to, to try to control their therapy outcome. Don't become their therapist outside of the session by lecturing on them, them on what you heard and what they should be doing and aren't doing. Therapy and medication are not a quick fix, and they may need to be resources to return to over time, as the symptoms of anxiety and depression wax and wane over time. The third, is reassure. Reassure the person struggling with words of affirmation. Remember for them and remember with them past hopeful stories, ways they're coping well. And this, in doing this, is an act of acceptance, of kindness, and patience. And the more you can do it, the better it is. These are not one offs, these are constant, ongoing strategies that continue to work in your life and in theirs. The fourth one that makes up the acronym PURE is ENCOURAGE. People who struggle with depression and anxiety lack courage at times, so your job is to encourage courage in them. Believe in them and hold on to hope for them when they can't hold on to it for themselves. Then there's a question. Mm. Why is it sometimes hard for us to walk alongside people who struggle? Anybody got any ideas? Why is it sometimes hard? Okay. Good one. What else? Can you say it a little bit louder? Lovely, yes. And I'll come back to that. She said, because you end up sometimes absorbing their feelings. And I'm gonna talk about that, that's great. Anybody else have anything you want to add to why is it sometimes hard to stay hanging out with people who have a mental illness? Depression, what was that? It's exhausting, yes. Back there? So it's hard to validate people when they're struggling and have them hear you? Is that what you're saying? Sorry? Yep. It's draining. Yeah because they're either putting it out there directly or passive aggressively, they're acting out and, and, and giving you their distorted thinking. Good. Anything else? Okay. Remember that I said also earlier that people who are struggling often want to isolate. And so they're doing a lot of things, either directly or passive aggressively to isolate. If they argue with you, if they're irritable, if they have no energy, if they're just not wanting to participate, then you'll leave them alone. And so they actually work against you being in relationship because part of them actually wants to isolate because that's comfortable with them, for them. But this, this um, gal over here expects, explains something that's important to know. Symptoms are contagious. So when someone is... Um, struggling with depression, the symptoms that they're experiencing that I explained earlier get all over you. So one way of thinking about these uh, difficulties is externalize them from the person. Once you do that, 
I'll try to draw a picture here. So if this is the person that's struggling with uh, depression and anxiety symptoms, recognize and see the symptoms outside of them. Even though they look like they're defined by them, they're not. They're actually very general in how they affect everyone. So, um, fear, uh, lethargy, negativeness, irritability, are some of the feelings that you see, but what's going on in their head is, I can't do that, I don't want to come, I don't want to participate, I won't have a good time. When they start saying those things, recognize that that's anxiety or depression talking. There's a really good uh, little book I don't have anymore, but it was called If Problems Could Talk. And so personify the depression that or, or anxiety symptoms and look at them outside of the person. So it makes it easier in some ways to go, oh, that's depression talking in your mind, or oh, that's one of those anxiety statements, or she's exhibiting or he's showing a little bit of this, that, or the other. When you can talk to those things outside of yourself, it helps you sometimes to stand up to them for yourself. And I'll give you an example. A number of years ago, I, um, I worked with a family who were missionaries, and again, I'm changing all the, the, the facts about it so you don't have to feel like I'm giving away secrets. Um, but they were a missionary family, and uh, they brought their son, who was a teenager and in a rebellious space, um, for therapy because they said he was depressed and he'd had an illness. And uh, so they said, could you fix him? And uh, I love working with teenagers, actually, um, because a lot of times I just work with them around what they think they need help with, not what their parents think they need help with. But this, this guy, you know, was told he had depression and the family came back from the mission field and it was a big deal and he felt really guilty, but not really because he wanted to be at home. Anyway, all these things were going along and the, the depression really wasn't getting a whole lot better and he was kind of belligerent about a lot of things and we started talking about his family. And what I found out was it really wasn't this boy that was depressed. It was the mom. But I'd never met the mom and of course teenagers don't tell you stuff. So I didn't really know that actually depression had gotten all over this entire family. But it started with one person and kind of became contagious. So while it was helpful on some level to help give this boy some skills, the person who actually ended up needing the counseling was the mom for different reasons. Being on the mission field isn't easy at times, very lonely and lots of things. But what was going on in that family was depression was getting all over all of them. So if you take that example and you look at um, uh, people who have significant compulsive anxiety stuff, they'll pull the whole family into helping them to be less anxious. And that can really get all over you and be exhausting and actually make you kind of angry because you feel kind of trapped in it. So recognize that's a really good point that the symptoms of anxiety and depression may not start with you, but they can be contagious and get all over your relationships. And sometimes when people are anxious, they become quite controlling. And so you're just saying, well, they're mean and they're angry and they're this and they're that, but really what they're doing is trying to control the situation so that they can feel better, but in fact, they're making it worse. Okay. A lot of the work I like to, to do for people who are walking alongside people with a lot of these symptoms that can be overwhelming and exhausting for us is to recommend that you learn and understand how to use timeouts. If a timeout is done inappropriately, it feeds into it. But if it's done appropriately, it's really helpful. Because when you're in it and it's exhausting, you need breaks. You need to step out so that your frustration or anger or sadness or fears can have a break. Timeouts are your friend, basically. So never give up, but just take the breaks and always sooner rather than later. When you are experiencing a yellow light, that's the time you take a, red, uh, take a timeout. You don't take it when you get to the red light. You take it at the yellow light. Watch for and pay attention to warning yellow light signs so that you can set self-care boundaries. 
And when you're not able to pull them off, you take a break so that you can breathe, so that you can relax, so that you can rest, so that you can come up with a resilient strategy to go back. Hanging with doesn't always mean hanging in, especially when you're not physically or emotionally able. So a timeout allows you to slow down, to pray, to rest, to reaffirm and remind yourself of what your role is and assert what's helpful to you as well as the other person. Don't always make it about rescuing, fixing, helping, appeasing the person with the symptoms. Sometimes the best thing for them is for you to take a break and back away so that they can actually learn to control their mood on their own. So, when you know what you're going to do with the timeout, deliver your plan clearly and respectfully and take it directly without apologizing and without rationalizing why you're doing it. So an assertive thing would be, I need to take a break right now. I'm going to Tim Hortons. I'll be back in half an hour. And when you come back, check in. Because a person that's having distorted thoughts is often feeling abandoned. And whatever that looks like to them, they can get angry or they can get sad. That's their issue to deal with, but you just need to be clear. I'm doing this, I'm going here, I'll come back. And when I come back, I'll engage with you again. Reconnect again with gentleness and assert what you and the person struggling with can talk about or do together. Don't get yourself into hours of helping a person fix their distorted thoughts. That's their job. You only have to identify it and you need to step away when it gets intense. So, what's a red light? When you blurt out something like, I don't care, just do what you want. And then you follow that with threatening consequences. This isn't likely what you really mean, and it's certainly not what's going to be helpful. So if you've said that, you missed the yellow light. Often when you say stuff like, I don't care, it doesn't mean you don't care. It's a, and it's an acknowledgement of you feeling or being out of control yourself. So we try to control and affect a needed uh, uh, outcome by just ramping up the consequences. I've had it. I can't do this anymore. They're just protective mechanisms that you've reverted to, and they usually don't work for you or the other. So when you start to realize you're doing that, you need to back it up, see what the yellow lights are for you, and take lots of breaks. But when you do take a break, and the person isn't doing well, expect resistance. Oh, there you go, you're always leaving. That's okay, just say, I'm still going to Tim Hortons. Just be consistent in what you're doing. And I've already said this, don't fall into the trap of trying to debate or argue with them. They're already debating and arguing enough in their own minds. Um, when people are anxious, they'll often invite or demand that you participate with them in their routines. And this can be a negative cycle that you can get drawn into just to appease them and stop the process. So, recognize when that's happening, be firm and kind and consistent, and just decline to participate. No, I won't be doing that, I'll meet you in the car. And then repair and distract and link to present moment conversations and tasks. Hey, when I went to Tim Hortons, I ran into so-and-so. You know what? We talked about such and such. Now you're distracting and you're normalizing a conversation instead of going back and rehashing and getting back into a cycle. Something that can sometimes help too when people are struggling is you've taken a break and you said you'll be back. And then when you come back, you can ask something like, you know, when you struggle like this, what helps, even a little? Get them to think for themselves. Don't try to fix what you think they're going through. Ask them, how'd you get yourself out of that? How did you come down from that? What helps? What could I do that might be helpful to you? But recognize sometimes they don't know, and they'll just say, I don't know. And when they say, I don't know, hang in there can get kind of awkward, be comfortable with silence, because sometimes an I don't know is simply they're processing and starting to think about, well, you know, that's a good question. I wonder what I did do. 
So now you're becoming a little bit more solution focused. Again, I've mentioned behaviors like aerobic exercise um, or music, etc. If you live alongside with somebody that's doing that, take them with you. Do you want to do a yoga class together? You want to do a walk together, etc. Um, and then the obvious mindfulness techniques. Mindfulness is a buzzword, but really mindfulness means learning to be aware. That's all it is. Be aware that, of your breathing. Be aware of what you're thinking. Be aware of what you're feeling and stand up to it. And then other things like watch about scheduled sleep, eight to nine hours a night. That sounds like a lot. Gee, well, I can survive on six. Well, you might, but your mood issues may be a lot more fragile as a result. So don't take less sleep as a badge of honor. More is always, in some ways, going to help you rest and, and become more resilient. Also things like drinking 60, 50 ounces of water in a day. Again, that's a helpful nutritional thing to do that's not a big deal. And then being careful to watch your diets. Um, we're not talking about weight loss, we're just looking at complex sugars, moderating your caffeine, moderating your alcohol consum uh, consumption, because those can feed into and make depression and anxiety symptoms more extreme. As you know, people with anxiety and depression can sometimes be more vul vul vulnerable to addictions because they're using it as a way of relaxing or avoiding or going into themselves because it's just so hard. But that doesn't mean it's a good, good way out. Okay, I also gave you on your sheet uh, helpful things to know and say to yourself when you're in situations like this. And I really like these because you can memorize these and they're pretty universal and they can use, you can use them almost in any situation. You say this in your head. You have this depressed teenager acting out, you know they're depressed, it's not going well, they're not making good choices and you leave the situation or they leave the situation and you say, God bless him, he's doing the best he can. When you say that out loud to yourself, you're saying, I accept where they are. God bless them, they're doing the best they can. As opposed to, I don't know why they can't, and they should. Just God bless them, they're doing the best they can. It neutralizes it for you. You say things like, I can stay present and tolerate how hard this is for me. And for him. And I don't need him to comply with what I think he should do in order for me to be okay. Again, these are acceptance kinds of statements. They're not giving in, they're not giving up. They're simply being in the present and saying, this is what's going on and I can tolerate it. And if I can't tolerate it, I'll take a time out. Number three, I'll always be directly and gently curious about what's going on for the other. Even if I have had some experience with mental illness, I won't assume that I know how this person's thinking and experiencing it and that what I do will help them, because it likely won't. Number four, I'll always take a position of not knowing. This is where deliberate humility is your best response. If you take a not knowing position instead of an I know what will help, you'll be more curious, you'll be more accepting, and you'll have more humility to listen and come alongside and not have expectations. I can be upset and I can take a break and come back to this relationship when I'm better able to respond in a way that's healthy for both of us. I'm not abandoning even if they feel or say that I am right now. Don't argue with it, just let it go. And then six, argue, arguing my point and talking them into seeing things more rationally will probably not work right now. Maybe never. I can choose though to still stay present but on more neutral, empathic terms. See, these things are about affirming yourself, affirming them, affirming what's going on, staying present, and not ramping up your expectations and need for outcomes. I like this one a lot. I need to remind myself that I actually have no idea what's really going on for this person in this moment. I will not assume I can or should know what to do to help. 
but I can ask curious questions and direct questions and check in. Not check up on, just check in. I don't have to take their inability or willingness to respond personally. I don't need to walk on eggshells or think that everything I say or do can or will think makes things better or worse. I'm not that responsible or powerful. If I am patient and present and curious in my interaction with this person, I can actually perhaps learn what they need and what they're experiencing. Red lights for people who are alongside people who are struggling. Is I know what they're experiencing. I know what they should be doing. They're just not doing it. And then you start telling them what they need to be doing, which shames and blames and overwhelms them. My gift in this moment is neutral empathy and my presence. This goes back to that whole story of Job and all the people that came alongside bringing casseroles and whatever it is they were doing and sitting with him and saying, you know, have you thought about this? And what would you do about that? And maybe we should pray more about this. I mean, I don't know what they were saying, but I'm guessing it wasn't real helpful. What was helpful was the people, if they did, that sat with them in the dirt and said, this sucks. This is really hard. They didn't try to do therapy. They just hung out, had a meal, maybe played chess, I don't know. But it's hanging out with people. And always remember, this isn't my responsibility to fix this person or make them better. My role, in fact, is just to be present, compassionate, and affirming and accept them as they are. This was the best part of David's first talk, which was, don't talk to people asking questions of, are you better yet? He didn't say it that way, but really that's what came out. How are you doing? How are you feeling? Is all about the illness. And what if they're not feeling so well? It gives them, in their minds, a sense of blame and shame, and I'm not good enough, and I'm not better yet, and you won't like me until I am. I will apologize directly when my response, however well-intentioned, is inappropriate, hurtful, and intense. Because when I repair with the person who's struggling, it models taking responsibility, keeping short accounts, and shows grace and authentic humility. I will repair quickly and clearly so I don't rationalize or minimize the value of what I need to do. It is never too late to go back and repair. And sometimes you actually have to wait to repair because the state that they're in means they can't hear you and they'll argue with you about it. So sometimes you have to hang on to the fact that you have to repair and wait for an opportune time when the person's able to hear you and repair and apologize. I'm sorry my reactions to what was going on were too extreme. Okay. And here's three affirming statements and a question that you can say to people who may be struggling. This is my big go-to for anything that goes on. I'm sorry it's so hard for you right now. That's it. You're figuring this out. You have some good resources and you will use them when you're ready. These are simple statements that aren't sugar-coated and aren't so complex that they miss it. I'm sorry it's so hard for you right now. Telling them that they're figuring it, this out is giving them the responsibility and ability to say, you're figuring this out. Not you need me to figure it out, let me rescue you, but you're figuring this out. And you got resources and I know you'll use them when you're ready. As opposed to, why aren't you doing that now? They're more accepting, they're more present focused, um, and they're really simple and profound. If you're going to say something profound and simple, don't say a lot of other stuff. It gets missed. And another question you can ask if they're in a good space is, what do you need from me right now? Not, what do you need from me? It's, what do you need from me right now that might be helpful? If they don't respond or they can't respond, wait. Get comfortable with silence and hanging with them. Because even when they don't know 
what they need from you right now, they're thinking about it. And that's important because it's their work, not your work. And then remember that we talked about behaviors. This is where you can be helpful to just distract and give them options. They're stuck, they're not doing well, you don't want them to isolate, and you say, I'm going to Rona, and I'm gonna pick up such and such. I'd like your company. You wanna come with me. That's different than, you need to get out. I'm going to Rona, um, you know, you probably have a good time, do you wanna come? You make a statement that I want to be with you. I see you, I get you, I want to hang with you. Here's an idea you want to come with. I want you to come with me. Not you should come with me, you need to get out. It's I want you to come, I want your presence with me. Then if they can sometimes get kind of testy and they give you something that you don't want to do that isn't appropriate, just decline. Just say no, I won't be able to do that. Anyway, see you later. Don't get into feeling like, oh well, because they're feeling so bad, I should let them do this, that, and the other, or I should do that with them. If your spidey sense tells you that's not helpful and it's not something you wanna do, it's okay to say no. And sometimes it's good to say no with a yes. I won't take you to Dairy Queen, but I will take you to Rona, is a different way of looking at saying a no with a yes. The last little bit that I want to talk to you about, and this is kind of important, and it's something that I often look at when I'm working with families who are struggling with one or two people that have mental illness. Sometimes you have to confront and deal with conflict that comes out of the symptoms of mental illness. Remember that isolation is not their friend or yours. The voices in their heads then get way too much free reign and they just need to be interrupted and stood up to or ignored and other energy or input or distraction is, or focus is needed. When they're all by themselves and their minds are saying negative or spinny or distorted things, they need somebody else's voice to be talking to them, another tape recorder to be on. They need energy, they need people to be with them to refute or disrupt what's going on in their head. So letting them be by themselves and put on their music, which is often you know, not real uplifting, it's not helpful to them. And in fact, when you're isolating for them, it's not helpful to you either. You don't know what's going on, now you're more worried about them and you're thinking, are they ever gonna come out of their bedroom or their den or whatever? But here's the second piece. If what they're doing in terms of symptoms is hurtful, is abusive, is controlling, is demanding, is manipulative, is coming out from an entitled or victim-oriented place, just respectfully and clearly tell them so. What you just said there was not okay. Then exit, that's time out time, and do it quickly because you need to look after yourself, otherwise you absorb whatever that negative stuff is that's been aggressive towards you. You can always re-enter later when it's more emotionally safe and you aren't traumatized by what's gone on. It's never okay, even if a person is not well, to hang out and hang in when what's going on is getting all over you and very hurtful and, dis and damaging. Um, after a timeout, sometimes it can be helpful if a person's doing well to simply say, you know, when I left, this is what I was thinking, this is what I was feeling, and here's what I want. What do you want and think and feel? Start the dialogue. I don't know where it'll go, but if you don't ask, you won't know. So don't walk on eggshells and don't be intimidated. Check in, start conversations, see where it takes you. If it doesn't take you anywhere, you can always step back and come around the back way and do it again. I have this great example of my daughter um, when she was in high school and struggling with something. And I walked into her bedroom. She was on the other side of the bed looking out the wall, kind of in a fetal position, just kind of sitting there. And uh, I came in, she said, go away. And I said, okay, are you okay? Just go away. I'm fine. And so there was this sort of sense of, uh-oh, I need to help here. And I said to her, um, okay, 
I'm going to go away and I'll be back in 10 minutes with a couple of cookies. She didn't say anything, but she heard me say, I'm coming back, right? I'm coming back. It wasn't any kind of directive on, I hope you feel better or you should do this. It was just, okay, yep, I get it. I'll be back 10 minutes later, come back, bring the cookies. She's feeling a little better because really she did her work. She needed to pout and feel bad and get angry, etc., in her own way, in her own head. She figured out something. I came back with the cookies. I didn't say, so what was going on? I just said, do you want a cookie? Hey, nice look out the window. It's snowing out there. We just stayed in the present moment. And then hours later, when she was much better and able to cope well, I said to her, so, you know, when you get like that, what helps? And by the way, did what I do help? Yeah, that was really good, Mom. You gave me my space. But I'm really glad you came back with the cookies. So it's having a dialogue to get them to think about what went on there for themselves. What did they learn? What helped? What did they do that got them out of it? Instead of confusing the issue. And, and always try to be careful about asking why questions. Why were you like that? Why were you feeling like that? Why do you do that? Why do you think like that? Don't ask why questions. Curious questions aren't why, they get them analyzing more. What do you, th what, do you what, what, when, where, how are curious questions? Um, truth is powerful in the telling even if the other cannot hear or acknowledge it. So when you affirm people, that's truth. I affirm that I care. Even if you don't think I do, I do. And don't use sarcasm because it's not life-giving, it's kind of veiled criticism. So if you find yourself using sarcasm, take a break because you're not, you're not coping well. And also, just watch, don't placate people. Don't, uh, well, don't placa placate them. Now, don't you feel better is a placating comment. It's not as helpful as, I had fun or it's great to see you smile. See them, notice them, observe them, affirm them, be with them. No agenda, no advice. Um, okay, my ending truth is this one more time. Ghosts among us are not scary. They're not mysterious and they're not needing to be left alone. They need to be seen and moved towards. And people are not defined by a mental or a physical illness. They're defined by the value that we give them. I said I'd bookend my comments going back to an exhortation from Philippians 4, verses 5 to 7. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. I hope I didn't overwhelm you with a lot of information, but there it is. Thanks for listening. Thank you, Jerry. I, well, you've obviously shown your appreciation to Jerry's work with us this evening, and we do say thank you for that. What I'd like to do and just suggest how we work things, we've got a couple of moments left. Um, we want to finish at 8.30, as we said, and it may be that you've made arrangements around that. What we're thinking perhaps we might do is at, you know, in a few minutes' time, we'll release you to allow you to go. Uh, and there's absolutely no shame in going if you have plans and things and you need to go. But Jerry's offered to just stay around for a little while afterwards and answer some questions that, that you, might, you might have. Um, how we'll do that is, 
if you have any questions and you want to stay back and ask them, if you can write them down on your table and then we'll move around and take those questions off you, uh, have a quick think. And we won't necessarily answer them, but we will respond. Some questions might be too big to answer, but we'll, we'll do our best to, to try and respond to them. What I'd love you to do just now, and I think this is always really helpful when, when we come to a seminar, it's got a lot of information. Many of you have taken notes furiously as the evenings went on. Why don't you just turn to someone on your table for a few moments and just talk to them very briefly about what you really found helpful tonight and that you're going to take away with that. It's a great way to get to meet people around your table. You don't need to share any deep personal information or anything like that. Just say, hey, do you know what I really enjoyed was when she said that or that particular thought or I've never thought about it like this before, but that really helped me. Are you comfortable enough to do that with someone at your table? It might be in twos or threes. Just take a moment uh, and then we'll dismiss you and you might also want to think about the questions that you want to ask if you want to stay back a little bit longer. So please feel free to talk to people at your table. Um, okay, I'll try and uh, address a couple of these questions so, and maybe so can Dave. Yeah, what we'll, do, uh, what we'll do here in this section then is we'll, like I say, we'll be, uh, we'll be at most half an hour. Uh, We've got some written questions, so thank you so much. There's a couple of extra there, actually, Jerry, as well. Oh, if you thank you. Uh, we have got a couple of questions here. We'll read them. It may be as the conversation is going on that you think, oh, I actually have a question relating to that, and I'd like to ask it. Uh, Bob has a, a roving microphone here, so we can actually we can take impromptu questions. Uh, is that the right word? Uh, impromptu questions as they come to you. So uh, it might be there's, there's opportunity for that as well. So, Jerry. Do you want to read the questions or yeah. want me to read the questions? Or? Um, I really like this question. I don't like the term mental illness. Can the term change? I have other illnesses and they're listed. Um, I think they should have a different term in understanding and acceptance. In my opinion, I'm open to definitions, open to another definition of the term illness. So I'll, um, I'll come clean on this. I really rarely ever use the term mental illness. And I used it because David used it and because I thought that was the connection for people. But I rarely would put something into such a general term which in our culture doesn't see it positively. There's a stigma attached to it. So I'm with this person. I, I actually wouldn't use that term, but I was kind of coming off how this had been, you know, talked about. And I don't have an issue with it, but I absolutely understand mm. physical illness, mental illness is an issue. Um, and and uh, so it's probably helpful to just look, talk about I'm struggling with some issues or I'm struggling with depression or I'm struggling with anxiety because those seem to be much more uh, understood or at least accepted within the context. But I always encourage people when they're struggling with anything to decide how they want to represent it, mm. how they want to define it. If I'm wa working with someone in a grief issue and the grief issue might have been something related to suicide and we know there's tons of stigmas out there, I'll ask them questions about how do you want to define this? How do you want to represent this to other people? Mm. And what do you need to be prepared for if you're going to be you know, right out there? Um, because language is really critical to people. And so they need to be comfortable with how they want to represent it. And yeah, I kind of don't go there. I usually talk about symptoms and, and uh, less diagnoses oriented. Mm -hmm. Although the truth is, that is what they are, but we need to learn to language it in ways that are better. So yeah. do you have a definition that you'd use? Well, so and, and depending on... So I, I very much relate to that question, and I, I understand it and, and would want to... Uh, be appreciative towards it for me and I suppose going back to my series I think mm -hmm. as I said at the start my I wasn't speaking to the series as a professional I was speaking to someone who journeyed that in my own life mm -hmm. for me actually the use of the term illness was really helpful for me mm -hmm. uh, so for me a lot of the the journey that I was on was was trying to not really take it seriously you mm -hmm. know and so push it away so it was just yep. a thing you know help you to own um, it. and so for me actually the illness piece helped me seek help, you know, mm -hmm. and start to talk to people to realize, okay, yeah, no, there is something that's not quite clicking for mm -hmm. me. Uh, and that, so that's probably... Where it came from. Yeah, but I wouldn't want to own it for anybody else. You know, yep. that just, that term helped me in, in, in my particular journey, which I suppose is the weird thing about mental illnesses. If it helps you, yep. then it is helpful, isn't it? And if it doesn't, then it's not. You know? Well, and again, it goes back to the notion of don't make assumptions about how people are going to respond to what you're saying. Yeah. Sometimes when I'll say to people, well, look, you know, 
what I'm seeing is this. You actually have attention deficit disorder. And, and here's, you know, here's what I'm thinking about that, etc. And then I'll say to them, so when I threw that out there, did you feel relieved? Because, oh, well, there's a reason and that explains it. Or did you feel uh, something else, whatever that is? Did you feel no or denial or I don't want to talk about it? Because some part of that is them learning to understand and interface with it at the level that they can at yeah. the time. But don't assume people won't say, oh, well, that, well now I feel a lot better because I thought I was crazy. <laughs> yeah. And it's good for them to be able to sort of attach themselves to something that yeah. now they can understand. Where I found like preparing the series quite uh, awkward at times was, I, and why I really relate to this question is, although I'm personally comfortable with the word illness, I really don't like it when I hear people use language I'm not comfortable with yeah. onto me, you yeah. know, and you feel like, oh no, that's not how I would define that. And it's yeah. kind of weird tension that you feel like. So in the series, I try to change the language around from time to time because I realize that one term for one person can be helpful, the mm -hmm. very same term for someone else is deeply unhelpful. So yeah. I think it's a great question. Yeah. Um, what help can one be to someone you, who someone you know who suffers from a depression but doesn't seek intervention? Um, well, it's kind of the theme of what we were talking about. Maybe you've got some ideas. I think never give up on them. Never say, well, that's it then. I guess they're not going to get any help. Uh, on some level, some of the things we talked about tonight are the intervention and you're the only person that can give it to them. And it doesn't mean you have to act as if you're a doctor or a psychologist or whoever, but you can use some of the same interventions, even if you don't feel like they're listening. There are times when they do hear you. It's very interesting, too, to make invitations without expectations. Sometimes I'll get people in my office who come with a card, and they say, I've had this card for four years. My friend gave it to me, and I'm finally ready in some ways, to come and do this work. So you never really know the timing of the intervention or the invitation to get help. But even if not, you be the help in the role that you get to play as a friend, as a boss, as a sibling, um, to talk about it, make invitations, and interface with them in an accepting kind of way. Mm. So that is kind of the theme of what we've talked about. What's your role? and yeah. play it over and over again, even if you don't see a response. Do you think that, uh, I was thinking back to what you said at the start of the seminar tonight, do you think that there can be, when we, when we struggle with anything, physical uh, challenges or mental challenges, there's often, I think the example, the exercise you did at the start was really helpful, there's be stigmas about the particular thing. Mm -hmm. It seems to me in my conversations with people and in my own experience, there's an additional stigma with mental health mm -hmm. that actually going to see someone, you know, adds in another stigma. So if you were, I, I'm trying to think of something, you know, if you were diabetic, right? Mm -hmm. So you might have the, the, the stigma about you're feeling diabetic, mm -hmm. but going to the doctor is an accepted, socially mm -hmm. acceptable cure for that. So mm -hmm. you go and see the doctor. Mm -hmm. But I find with people that struggle with their mental health, there's mm -hmm. the stigma of I have anxiety or depression, and then the stigma of I'm seeing a counselor mm -hmm. or a psychologist or something. Mm -hmm. and, and so in, again, in my experience and people that I've talked to, hearing from those closest to you that their feelings for you are not changed by you seeking help, going help, journeying with you on that help mm -hmm. has been a huge thing for a lot of people. When they first are brave enough to say to someone, I think I need to go and see someone yeah. and realize that the people that love them have responded positively rather than negatively can mm -hmm. be a huge help in, in that. So it's that, it's that stigma battle that I think is so hard for somebody that might know they've got a problem, is scared that they're that they've gone mm -hmm. completely crazy and mm -hmm. doesn't want to seek the help. So hearing that affirmation from people, at least again in my experience, was, was hugely, hugely yeah. helpful. I don't yeah. know if that makes sense in that sort of... Yeah. Well, it's a huge... Any time to go and seek help requires you to let go of some of your pride or some of your control or mm. some of your fear. And so sometimes we'll just talk about that. So 
what was it like preparing to come today? Or mm -hmm. what are you thinking about being here? What are you worried about being here? Mm -hmm. And just having that dialogue for some people helps them to feel comfortable that I'm not some weirdo that's going to, you know, prescribe something strange or tell them that they're crazy. And that is an interesting question. Um, I'd say the most common thing people worry about in going to see a psychologist is they think they're crazy. They really do. Something's built up in their head that they're going to tell me I'm crazy. Um, and crazy is not a diagnosis, by the way. Um, but sometimes I'll just cut right through it and I'll say, what are you most worried about? Well, I, I, I'm worried that you'll think I'm crazy. And I'll say, well, I can tell you right now you're not crazy. There is no such diagnosis. And we laugh about it in terms of, sometimes they don't come up with that right away. They'll come up with it later. So, so do you think I'm crazy? Nope. I don't think you're crazy. And then we move on. We keep it simple, and then we move to things that they can talk about and think about. Um, but they give themselves so many labels, um, or they let other people give them, them labels. And yeah. psychologists have labels, so I live with that as well. Oh, I'm going to this person because I have these problems, and they're going to fix me. Well, that's a label on me that I said right at the get-go. That's not my job. My job's not to fix you. My job is to come alongside, understand, not make assumptions, figure out what you need help with. And that's usually what I'll say. When you thought about coming today, if we were going to you know, do some work together and it was going to be helpful, what's the outcome you want? Because this isn't my agenda. This is yours. And if you don't have an agenda, let's figure out one. So it's a team approach as opposed to I'm the big expert. Um, helping to understand what's going on with them and letting go some of their labels. And you're right, they often don't want to tell anybody that they went to a psychologist. And this is another big one, especially when couples are having difficulty. Um, one won't want to tell the other person that they went to the psychologist, and there's good reasons for it, because the other person can then start unpacking it and putting labels on it, and, well, did you tell them about me? And, and then they lose control of their process of trying to... Um, to heal, to figure out how to stand up for themselves or what's going on with themselves. So you don't sometimes want other people to interface with it until you really know what help it is to you. Mm. So you can stand up to it and say, yeah, well, what'd you talk about? Oh, it's far too early to talk about that. And you give them role plays on how to stand up to, mm. you know, what other people might say to put you down or say, oh, you're not going to take meds, are you? Um, mm. You just don't go there. You don't put yourself in a vulnerable, fragile mm. place where people can in some ways, take that apart. Um, as the support person, how do you not let their blame get in? Love this question. Well, I think that's what you name it. Oh, they're blaming me. Oh, this is one of those, you're abandoning me. Again, it goes back to some of what I was saying earlier. Look at blame as something outside of them that they're doing. Once you see, oh, that's that blame thing going on, you can kind of stand up to it differently as opposed to, I really hate them blaming me. Now you're into the person instead of externalizing it. So anytime you get something that's negative, set it out there and then fight against it. Say, well, I don't need to really pay attention to this. Or, well, that's that blame thing. Um, you know, it's a reactive protective mechanism. What should I be doing that would be helpful? And I'm a big one on when you're not doing well with it and you're absorbing it, take off, take a break, so that you don't absorb it and start letting it get the best of you. Breaks are really important no matter how the other person feels about you taking them. Mm. You take a break so you can go back. So I don't know if that answered the question. It's very hard, and so the big thing is be aware that it's going on. Yeah. Um, um, I've struggled with anxiety for years. I know what my best coping strategies are, but I have a family member who refuses to accept that they also struggle with anxiety. How do we approach this with them? Well, why don't you field that one? <coughs> Sorry. Read that question just again to me while I choke. Um, it's you. a person who struggles with anxiety who's mm. has learned some things, mm -hmm. um, but they also have someone close to them that also struggles with it, but refuses to accept that they do. Mm. So, how do you approach this with them? I've found uh, the kind of the projection thing quite 
difficult uh, in, in terms of my own journey with, mm -hmm. with anxiety. So having, I might be wrong in this, so I kind of imagine anxiety on a kind of spectrum, right? Mm -hmm. um, where if I was to draw the spectrum, you have people over here with mild levels of anxiety, I'm getting on a plane, you know, mm -hmm. uh, to people that are, I'm not getting on a plane. Mm -hmm. But I imagine this sort of arc working like this, that it kind of, it hits a point and then it kind of drops off a cliff. And, mm -hmm. and there's almost like some people kind of move on their anxiety. This is not a professional opinion, admittedly. Some people move on the spectrum and then some of us have just peeked over the edge and we kind of find our anxiety now is controlling us mm -hmm. as opposed to just being sort of helpful. And, uh, and what I've found is as I've started to try and so, you know, as an academic, you know, you go to a psychologist, they say, oh, it looks like you're struggling with anxiety. So I go home and buy every book on anxiety that I can find and read about it. And then decide that everybody in the world has anxiety because I see these symptoms all over the place. So what's been hard for me is not to see it where it's not there. But mm -hmm. I have found myself in, you know, so I was a lecturer at a college for, you know, nine years, uh, you know, and you saw students displaying attributes from time to time that I would find myself realizing, oh, I, I, know, what, I know what that is. And they're in this particular point in life and anxiety among students and, you know, it's quite a high thing. So, so I've found the journey of learning about my own sort of, uh, I almost used the word illness again there, but my own anxiety uh, being one that has helped me to see it in others. And then I found conversation has been really helpful with that. You know, mm -hmm. so people, you know, I'll, you know, I see things in people, I find myself talking to them and then say, hey, you know, I really feel this sometimes. And, and it's amazing how often that um, well, solidarity, you know, uh, oh, yeah, yeah, no, I, I feel like that sometimes as well. And I mean, I, I'm in a hugely privileged position because in a, in a role as a pastor, you say things on stage and that opens up. So I have lots of people have talked to me in the mm -hmm. few weeks since we taught this series and they feel, oh, you're safe now to talk to. Yeah. But sometimes those breadcrumbs with people. So you, you're suffering from anxiety. You see it in someone else. You start to open up and talk about your own journey. Mm -hmm. I've found pretty much every time somebody mm -hmm. else has then started to say, oh, you know what? I, I feel a little like that sometimes. And how did mm -hmm. you deal with it? And you know mm -hmm. what I mean? That conversation. For me, it, it's... There's a weird thing that when you meet someone that's on a journey similar to yours, there's a solidarity that comes there. That, mm -hmm. that like, I kind of know your journey a little bit better as a result. And, and I think that most people don't want to be lonely, but mm -hmm. feel like they're in a world where no one really understands. And when somebody just pops a little flag up, just above the trench to say, I also feel like this, you feel safer with that person. Yeah. So, so my experience has been, being honest with my own self, has helped other people you know, to be honest, you know, and, okay. and, and sort of journey. Then I, I don't know if that's right and that's the right thing to do, but I found that. Well, that I think there's helpful. lots. I think there's lots of ways to look at it. Mm. This may be a case where somebody um, doesn't want to see that, yeah. yes. and and for whatever reasons. Um, I think then sometimes um, it's okay to let them have to figure it out, but. Ask yourself, if you're in this situation, how does this person learn? Like, do they learn when I share and they go, yeah, me too? Does this person learn from books that yeah. I leave around? Does this person learn when somebody confronts them directly? Or do they learn indirectly? You know how you'll say to kids sometimes, you know, you need to do this, blah, 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 blah. And, and they go, yeah, 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 whatever. Then you say them, see them the next day telling their friend, hey, you should, you know, I learned this. And they won't acknowledge that where they got it from. They just absorbed it somehow. Yeah. So somehow modeling healing journey is a good thing. But sometimes ask yourself, well, when I've seen them pick stuff up before, how did they do that? And if you figure out some small thing, that may your, be your entrance in, yes. if you see what I'm getting yeah. at. So you know, how absolutely. do people learn matters? Some people watch movies and the yeah. movies speak to them and other people read books and the book speaks to them and some people want a science paper, you yeah. know, and, and, and that's, yeah. that would be my journey. You know, if somebody said to me, hey, you know, I'm picking up that you've got mm -hmm. anxiety, let's watch this movie about anxiety, like mm -hmm. that sounds like a really anxious thing for me to do. But if somebody said, you know, I read this journal and here's this paper, yeah. you might, that would, for me, yeah. that would be like, oh yeah, let me have a look at that. So mm -hmm. I, that's a really, I think that's a brilliant piece of advice. And people learn auditorily and visually and, you know, academically, they learn through books. I wouldn't, as a therapist, say, so, and anyways, thanks very much, here's a book. <laughs> I, I don't do that because 
often that's not how people learn. If they're an academic, they'll ask for the book. But giving them a book, then it's kind of like, well, I thought I was coming to you for some help. <laughs> so you have to be very sensitive to how they learn things in the past. And when I was in graduate school, we were given 10 movies that we were to watch. Wow. And probably because the therapist that was teaching us thought they'd be helpful. And actually, I'm a visual person. I found them very helpful. Um, because they gave me the same kind of examples so you could be in relationship and see what it was looking like from both sides. So yeah. I think movies are great, but... Um, got one more here. Oh, this one's about sleep. Eight to nine hours a night. How do you enforce that as a symptom um, when you have trouble falling asleep? Um, again, it's education only it's throwing out the need for it. It's talking about what gets in the way if they say, well, I can't, I can't do that. And I'll say, well, then if it isn't about actual sleep, what is it about the process of relaxing, even if you're not sleeping? What helps? What behaviors help you to slow down or distract or connect so that um, they're beginning the process of slowing down even if they're not sleeping? So there's a whole process with sleep um, that I'm not a super uh, expert on, but even to say to somebody, well, you should get this much sleep, it's, so what do you do prior to getting to sleep, and what would happen if you tried that process 15 minutes earlier? So yeah, I'm gonna lay awake and I'm gonna do these things, and I'll, I'll also talk to people about, so when your mind's spinning, when you go to sleep, and you've tried to do all the right things and your mind's spinning, get up. Just get up and say, so, I'm gonna get up, I'm gonna go, I'm gonna get a glass of hot milk, I'm going to, in my case, do a crossword puzzle because effectively that makes me fall asleep. I'm gonna do this and in 20 minutes, I'm gonna come back and I'm gonna go back to sleep. Instead of, well, there it goes, I got this big meeting tomorrow and I can't sleep and it's gonna be really bad and I'm already feeling terrible. And so you've thrown out the night before you've said, well, I can't sleep right now but I can prophesy and promise myself that I'm gonna do this, then I'm gonna do this, then I'm gonna do this, then I'm gonna fall asleep. It's really interesting that you can tell your brain to do things and follow it through instead of get into the panic of, uh-oh, now what? Yeah. Um, so you can train yourself in some ways, although it's not easy. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah, no, absolutely. As, as somebody that got five hours last night, maybe I should do that as well. <laughs> I find well, that... Well, and not saying, oh, well, I got five hours last night. I probably won't be able to sleep tonight, too. So yeah. it's just thinking about interrupting the pattern and prophesying and deciding a behavior that will yeah. maybe interrupt that. I think that and I think this is maybe a Western problem, uh, not just for people that have anxiety, but our, it seems to me that our sleep patterns have gotten really messed up by, you know, we take these anxiety devices to bed with us. You know, the matter of people that that the last thing they do before they go to bed is, you know, oh, let's just quickly check our emails mm -hmm. and uh, then, oh, goodness, that's coming up tomorrow, I've got to do that. And let's read the news because the news is always a great way to relax you about mm -hmm. what's going on in the world. And, you know, mm -hmm. and all these things that we, the bad habits that we do, mm -hmm. you know. So uh, my, and, and a sort of notional example, my, uh, my father has a lot of problems with sleeping and uh, he went to a sleep therapist recently and the mm -hmm. one thing they said to him was, well, the only thing you should do in your bedroom is sleep. Yeah. <laughs> do nothing, don't have anything plugged in in there, mm -hmm. don't have a TV in there, mm -hmm. you know, you go there and, and, and you kind of get into the routine. Mm -hmm. And it struck me as I thought about it, like, we do this with our children, we have routine, like, you know, you wash mm -hmm. them, you mm -hmm. put them in their PJs, and then mm -hmm. they go to bed and they sleep. Mm -hmm. And then somewhere along adulthood, we get into these random methods, mm -hmm. and bed becomes this place to be more anxious and worry about it. And, yeah. and so I've found that to be a, a real challenge, and, and you get caught in that cycle uh, yeah. of sort of worrying about not sleeping, so that gets added to the list. So that's, yeah. that's good advice. That's good advice. Um, well, and I mean, I think that's been an issue for lots of people, where there's a TV or that's mm -hmm. a place where they, in their bedroom, where they uh, eat or they do lots of things that then are associated with that space and that can create problems. Um, and I think routine kind of matters. Um, but I think it's, it's important to sort of say, well, instead of just giving into it, yeah. come up with some ideas yes. about what haven't I learned, but don't get me started with um, devices. <laughs> I, I, I really, while I can't stop it, I'm not gonna be surprised and I'm not surprised that the levels of anxiety 
when you're always on and when you're exposed to screens. I mean, the research is all there. I don't know how we stop it, but it's huge and it hugely plays in. And I think we've just kind of tolerated it and accepted it as well. That's our culture. Yeah. But it's, it's really difficult because it's more information coming in. You got enough stuff going on in your head. You just allowed yeah. more stuff yes. to think about. And um, one of the things I do in terms of anxiety after a day of work where my brain's kind of fried, I used to be able to make good transitions, fast transitions. Maybe I had to when my kids were littler. But now I sort of give myself permission to say, you know what, if I try to do too much right now, I'm going to get irritable, I'm going to get overwhelmed, I'm going to get hangry, whatever. I've acknowledged the fact that I need a buffer and I fortunately have the opportunity because my kids aren't little anymore. But it's just accepting the fact that you need transition time and not to expect so much from yourself, but don't go brain dead and go home and watch TV. Just decide, you know what, I, I'm going to do these three things. Mm -hmm. And then eventually my brain will catch up and then I'll be able to engage. But it's okay to give yourself permission to take your own time out yeah, yeah. Um, when you're anxious. That's fantastic, Jerry. Maybe there are a few questions that have come to mind. Bob, you had a question. Do you want to well, throw that question in with a couple of... Yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh, well, okay, here's my question. Um, what movies do you want to suggest to us tonight? Oh, gosh. Um, because even though David and I are bookish, we both love movies. That's the uh -huh. truth. Yeah, it's yeah. true. And, uh, and, and I taught a course, or a couple of courses, where I used movies as an yeah. incredible illust illustrative tool yeah. for ways of thinking or whatever. Do you have any to suggest to us tonight? Oh, man. Or David? Yeah, do you have any, David? Um, I, I can think of the movies back then, but they're not on now. Any movies, I think, where uh, there's character development and a person struggles, mm. and it's not always a happy ending, but there's some sense of, of using strategies or conversing with people or being transparent, mm -hmm. going through something and being resilient. Um, and it's not always a happy ending movie. Any of those kind of movies that have character development in them as opposed to, oh yeah, it always works out really well or it's just a real downer. I don't like going to see downer movies. I like to see movies that cause some level of hope and that usually has to do with some kind of character development. Mm -hmm. Even cartoon movies. You know what, the best movie I saw this year was Cinderella. <laughs> not the cartoon one, but the one that was the real Cinderella one because the message all the way through that movie was be kind and courageous. I mean, it sounds so simple, but it was really well acted out, forgiveness and, you know, feeling abused and all of those things and hanging on to hope and dealing with ugly stepsisters. Mm. They did it well. Mm. So the message, even when it's direct, mm -hmm. can be really powerful. But yeah. Cinderella, there you go. <laughs> yeah. The classics. The classic. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> Well, listen, thank you so much for being with us tonight. I hope that you have a lot to think about. Uh, I hope that it's uh, been helpful, uh, and, and I know it has been helpful. You know, uh, I just, uh, I'm appreciative of people taking a Wednesday night with everything that goes on in life to, to come out and be with us this evening. So thank you so much for that. Thank you, Jerry, for You're your welcome. time. I thoroughly appreciate that, as thank do we you. all. And okay. So travel safely. Hopefully we've not been snowed in while we've been here. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, God bless you. <laughs>